Did Ukraine hit Russia's best fighter jet? Who are the foreigners fighting in the Russian military? And what's this list that Republicans are talking about? This is week 120 of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I'm Anna Belliker, reporting to you from Kyiv, and I'll be taking you through the top three stories from Ukraine from this week. This week, Ukraine has struck Russia's most advanced fighter jet, the Su-57, for the first time. Not one, but two Su-57s were damaged in a single Ukrainian drone strike on an airfield in Astrakhan, almost 600 kilometers from the front line. It's Russia's most modern combat jet, which the Russian Air Force debuted in 2020. One Su-57 is estimated to cost between 30 and $50 million. The Su-57 has joined the likes of Russia's Su-24, Su-25, Su-34, and Su-35, which Ukraine has successfully targeted before. In total, Ukraine claims to have destroyed 359 Russian military aircraft since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. While there's a symbolic satisfaction in damaging a plane that Russia takes pride in, the Su-57 isn't quite the Goliath that the Kremlin claims it to be. The jet was designed as a response to the American F-22 Raptor, which the US stopped producing in 2011, nine years before the first Su-57 entered into service, which means that the plane has already been outpaced by a few other nations. Though former Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu said that the Su-57 has shown itself brilliantly in the war against Ukraine, the jet hasn't actually seen a ton of action. It's primarily being used to launch missiles, which can be done as effectively by previous models of planes. Some military analysts say that the Su-57 has been more useful for showing off at arms fairs than for actual combat missions. In other jet-related news, France has announced that it will give Ukraine an unspecified number of 2005 Mirage fighter jets, which can be used for both defensive and offensive operations. There will be a period of up to six months for Ukrainian pilots to receive training on the jets, so they will be delivered to Ukraine no sooner than the end of the year. This will be in addition to the dozens of F-16 jets pledged by Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway, and Denmark, which will be delivered to Ukraine in batches starting as early as this summer. Russia has long been accused of recruiting, pressuring, and outright forcing foreign nationals into its armed forces since the start of the full-scale invasion. This week, Bloomberg reported that Russia is threatening to revoke the visas of African students and workers living in Russia if they don't join the military. There are between 35 and 37,000 students from Africa living in Russia, as well as an estimated 6 million migrants from Central Asia. The Kremlin has focused on recruiting from these populations as Russia's casualty rates have soared to over 1,000 soldiers per day in recent months. Along with threatening tactics, Russia also tries to market its military as a glamorous way for foreign fighters to make money. Russia promises high salaries, passports, immigration support for families. For those living in desperation in underdeveloped states, these promises sound like lifelines. It must be noted, however, that Russia has a track record of not living up to its promises when it comes to the protection of its military, and foreign fighters are no exception. Foreigners have reported not receiving compensation while being sent on dangerous missions in frontline areas. A handful of far-right American politicians and commentators have once again emerged with the claim that they have been put on an enemies list created by the Ukrainian government. The actual list in question was part of a bigger analysis of opposition to the U.S. aid for Ukraine in the American media and political circles. The list did not contain any personal information about those named on it or any call to punish them. It was made by a Ukrainian NGO called Texty, which has no affiliation with and receives no funding from any government. So the list came to the attention of Indiana Republican Jim Banks, who spread the word to his congressional colleagues that they were under threat. Banks wrote on his personal account on Twitter that he had been put on an enemies list that was compiled by the Ukrainian government. Banks's claims caught the attention of Elon Musk, who tweeted that the Ukrainian NGO should be added to the list of sanctioned terrorist organizations. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene also tweeted on June 10th that President Volodymyr Zelensky had added her and other elected members of Congress to a state kill list. 
A similar version of this story happened a few months ago after a different Ukrainian NGO added far-right commentator Tucker Carlson to a list of national security threats, which was widely misreported on Twitter as a Ukrainian kill list. Ultimately, these disinformation campaigns just serve the Kremlin's interests. As the US election draws closer, we can expect an uptick in Russia planting and encouraging conspiracies that sow discord and trigger high emotion within the American public toward Ukraine. That's all for this week. We'll be back next Sunday with more stories from Ukraine. Your support is what makes our work possible. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to this channel. If you'd like to become a member of the Kiev Independent community, please visit the link in the description below. I'll see you next week.